Now, in tonight's debate, Dr. Drange and I have been invited to assess two competing worldviews, atheism versus theism, in answer to the question, does God exist? Accordingly, I'm going to defend two basic contentions tonight. Number one, that there are no good reasons to think that atheism is true. And number two, there are good reasons to think that theism is true. So let me say a word about that first major contention, that there are no good reasons to think that atheism is true. Now, Dr. Drange has two arguments for atheism, which I've uh, read in his published works, and I frankly don't find either of them uh, very compelling, but it would be inappropriate for me to attack them before they're presented. So I'll simply wait to hear them and then respond in my next speech. So let me turn at this point, without further ado, to the defense of my second basic contention, that there are good reasons to think that theism is true. Now tonight I'm going to present five reasons why I think theism makes more sense than atheism. And if you're following in your outline, I'm going to skip the argument from abstract objects and go straight to the argument that God makes sense of the origin of the universe. Have you ever asked yourself why anything at all exists? why the universe exists, where everything came from instead of just nothing. Well, typically, atheists have said that the universe is just eternal, and that's all. But surely this doesn't make sense. Just think about it for a minute. If the universe never had a beginning, then that means that the number of events in the history of the universe is infinite. But mathematicians recognize that the idea of an actually infinite number of things leads to self-contradictions. For example, what is infinity minus infinity? Well, mathematically, you get self-contradictory answers. This shows that infinity is just an idea in your mind, not something that exists in reality. David Hilbert, perhaps the greatest mathematician of this century, states, the infinite is nowhere to be found in reality. It neither exists in nature nor provides a legitimate basis for rational thought. The role that remains for the infinite to play is solely that of an idea. But that entails that since past events are not just ideas but are real, that the number of past events must be finite. Therefore, the series of past events can't go back forever Rather, the universe must have begun to exist. This conclusion has been confirmed by remarkable discoveries in astronomy and astrophysics. The astrophysical evidence indicates that the universe began to exist in a great explosion called the Big Bang about 15 billion years ago. Physical space and time were created in that event, as well as all the matter and energy in the universe. Therefore, as the Cambridge astronomer Fred Hoyle points out, the Big Bang theory requires the creation of the universe from nothing. This is because as you go back in time, you reach a point at which, in Hoyle's words, the universe was shrunk down to nothing at all. Thus, what the Big Bang model requires is that the universe began to exist and was created out of nothing. Now, this tends to be very awkward for the atheist. For as Anthony Kenny of Oxford University urges, a proponent of the Big Bang theory, at least if he is an atheist, must believe that the universe came from nothing and by nothing. But surely, that doesn't make sense. Out of nothing, nothing comes. So why does the universe exist instead of just nothing? Where did it come from? There must have been a cause which brought the universe into being. Now, from the very nature of the case, this cause must have been an uncaused, changeless, timeless, and immaterial being which created the universe. It must be uncaused because there cannot be an infinite regress of causes. It must be timeless and therefore changeless, at least without the universe, because it created time, 
because it also created space. It must transcend space and therefore be immaterial, not physical. Moreover, I want to argue, it must also be personal. For how else could a timeless cause give rise to a temporal effect like the universe? If the cause were just a mechanically operating set of necessary and sufficient conditions, then the cause could never exist without the effect. If the cause is timelessly present, then the effect would be timelessly present as well. The only way for the cause to be timeless and for the effect to begin to exist in time would be if the cause is a personal agent who freely chooses to create an effect in time without any prior determining conditions. And thus, we're brought not merely to a transcendent cause of the universe, but to its personal creator. Isn't it incredible that the Big Bang Theory thus fits in with what the Christian theist has always believed, that in the beginning God created the universe? Now, I put it to you, which is more probable, that the Christian theist is right, or that the universe just popped into being, uncaused, out of nothing? I at least don't have any trouble assessing these probabilities. Number two. God makes sense of the complex order in the universe. During the last 30 years, scientists have discovered that the existence of intelligent life depends upon a complex and delicate balance of initial conditions simply given in the Big Bang itself. We now know that life-prohibiting universes are vastly more probable than any life-permitting universe like ours. How much more probable? Well, before I give you an estimation, let me just give you some numbers to give you a feel for the odds. The number of seconds in the history of the universe is 10 to the 18th power. That's 10 followed by 18 zeros. The number of subatomic particles in the entire known universe is said to be about 10 to the 80th power. Now, with those numbers in mind, consider the following. Donald Page, one of America's eminent cosmologists, has calculated the odds of our universe existing as being on the order of one chance out of 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 124, a number which is so inconceivable that to call it astronomical would be a wild understatement. Our discovery of the fine tuning of the Big Bang for intelligent life is like someone's trudging through the Sahara Desert and rounding a sand dune, suddenly being encountered with a skyscraper the size of the Empire State Building. We would rightly dismiss as mad any suggestion that it just happened to come together there by chance. And we would find equally insane the idea that any arrangement of sand particles at that place is improbable and therefore there's nothing to be explained. But why is this? Well, I think it's because the skyscraper exhibits a complexity which is absent from just random arrangements of sand. But why should the complexity of the skyscraper strike us as special? John Leslie, the contemporary philosopher who has most occupied himself with this question, says it is because there is an evident explanation of the complex skyscraper, an explanation which is not suggested by just random arrangements of sand, namely intelligent design. In the same way, Leslie concludes, the fine tuning of the universe for intelligent life points to the evident explanation of intelligent design. So once again, the view that Christian theists have always held that there is an intelligent designer and architect of the universe seems to make much more sense than the atheistic view that the universe, when it popped into being, uncaused, out of nothing, just happened to be, by chance, fine-tuned to an incomprehensible precision for the existence of intelligent life. Number three. God makes sense of objective moral values in the world. 
If God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist. Many theists and atheists alike concur on this point. For example, the late J.L. Mackey of Oxford University, one of the most eminent uh, atheists of our day, admitted if there are objective values, they make the existence of a god more probable than it would have been without them. Thus, we have a defensible argument from morality to the existence of a god. But in order to avoid God's existence, Mackey therefore denied that objective moral values exist. He wrote, it is easy to explain this moral sense as a natural product of biological and social evolution. Professor Michael Roos, a philosopher of science at the University of Guelph, agrees. He explains, morality is a biological adaptation no less than our hands and feet and teeth, considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something, ethics is illusory. I appreciate that when somebody says, love thy neighbor as thyself, they think they are referring above and beyond themselves. Nevertheless, such reference is truly without foundation. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction and any deeper meaning is illusory. Friedrich Nietzsche, the great atheist of the last century who proclaimed the death of God, understood that the death of God meant the destruction of all meaning and value in life. I think that Friedrich Nietzsche was right. But we've got to be very careful here. The question here is not, must we believe in God in order to live moral lives. I'm not claiming that we must. Nor is the question, can we recognize objective moral values without believing in God? I think that we can. Rather, the question is, if God does not exist, do objective moral values exist? Like Mackey and Roos, I just don't see any reason to think that in the absence of God, the morality evolved by Homo sapiens is objective. After all, if there is no God, then what's so special about human beings? They're just accidental byproducts of nature, which have evolved relatively recently on an infinitesimal speck of dust, lost somewhere in a hostile and mindless universe in which are doomed to perish individually and collectively in a relatively short time. On the atheistic view, some actions, say rape, may not be socially advantageous and so in the course of human development has become taboo. But that does absolutely nothing to prove that rape is really wrong. On the atheistic view, apart from the social consequences, there's nothing really wrong with your raping someone. Thus, without God, there is no absolute right and wrong which imposes itself on our conscience. But the problem is that objective values do exist, and deep down we all know it. There is no more reason to deny the existence of objective moral values than the existence of objective uh, physical objects in the world. Actions like rape, torture, and child abuse aren't just socially unacceptable behavior. They're moral abominations. Some things, at least, are really wrong. Similarly, love, equality, and self-sacrifice are really good. But if objective values cannot exist without God, and objective values do exist, then it follows logically and inescapably that God exists. Number four, God makes sense of the historical facts concerning the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, was a remarkable individual. New Testament critics have reached something of a consensus that the historical Jesus came on the scene with an unprecedented sense of divine authority, the authority to stand and speak in God's place. That's why the Jewish leadership instigated his crucifixion for the charge of blasphemy. He claimed that in himself the kingdom of God had come. And as visible demonstrations of this fact, he carried out a ministry of miracle working and exorcisms. But certainly the supreme confirmation of his claim was his resurrection from the dead.
If Jesus really did rise from the dead, then it seems that we have a divine miracle on our hands, and thus evidence for the existence of God. Now there are three main historical facts that support the resurrection of Jesus. The empty tomb, Jesus' post-mortem appearances alive, and the very origin of the Christian faith. Let me say a brief word about each one of these. First, the evidence indicates that Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers on Sunday morning. According to Jakob Kramer, an Austrian scholar who has specialized in the study of the resurrection, by far, most scholars hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb. And he lists 28 prominent scholars in support. I can think of at least 16 more that he neglected to mention. According to D. H. Van Dalen, it is extremely difficult to object to the empty tomb on historical grounds. Those who deny it do so on the basis of theological or philosophical assumptions. Second, the evidence indicates that on separate occasions, different individuals and groups of people saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death. According to the late Norman Perrin of the University of Chicago, the more we investigate the traditions with respect to the appearances, the firmer the rock begins to appear upon which they are based. These appearances were physical and bodily and were witnessed not only by believers, but also by skeptics, unbelievers, and even enemies. Third, the very origin of the Christian faith itself implies the reality of the resurrection. All scholars agree that Christianity sprang into being because the original disciples sincerely believed that God had raised Jesus of Nazareth from the dead, and they preached this message everywhere they went. But where in the world did they come up with that outlandish belief? Well, if you deny that Jesus really did rise from the dead, then you've got to explain the origin of the disciples' belief in terms of either Christian influences or Jewish influences. Now, obviously, it couldn't have come from Christian influences for the simple reason that there wasn't any Christianity yet. But neither can it be explained from the side of Jewish influences, because the Jewish concept of resurrection was radically different from Jesus' resurrection. As a renowned New Testament scholar, Joachim Yeramias, puts it, nowhere does one find in the literature of ancient Judaism anything comparable to the resurrection of Jesus. The most plausible explanation of the origin of the disciples' belief, therefore, is that the disciples were telling the truth. Jesus did rise from the dead. Attempts to explain away these three great facts, like the disciples stole the body or Jesus wasn't really dead, have been universally rejected by contemporary scholarship. The simple fact is that there just is no plausible naturalistic explanation of these three facts. Therefore, it seems to me the Christian is amply justified in believing that Jesus rose from the dead and was who he claimed to be. But that entails that God exists. Finally, number five, God can be immediately known and experienced. This isn't really an argument for God's existence. Rather, it's the claim that you can know that God exists wholly apart from arguments simply by immediately experiencing him. This was the way that people in the Bible knew God, as Professor John Hick explains. God was known to them as a dynamic will, interacting with their own wills, a sheer given reality, as inescapably to be reckoned with as destructive storm and life-giving sunshine. To them, God was not an idea adopted by the mind, but an experiential reality which gave significance to their lives. Now, if this is the case, then there's a danger that proofs for God could actually distract our attention from God himself. If you're sincerely seeking God, then I believe that God will make his existence evident to you. The Bible promises, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. We mustn't so concentrate on the external proofs that we fail to hear the inner voice of God to our own hearts. So in conclusion, we've yet to see any good reasons to think that God does not exist, we have seen five reasons to think that God does exist, and therefore I think we can agree that theism is the more plausible worldview.
First, I'd like to make a slight correction in the uh, program. <clears throat> in the place where it um, states the argument from non-belief, which is right in the middle of the page, there's a step four, and there's a line that was left out uh, of step four. And um, I'd like to uh, read it to you the way it, it should be, uh, uh, the way it should have appeared in there. Step four should read, Hence probably, if God were to exist, then he would not have permitted there to be as much non-belief in God and in the afterlife among humans as there actually is. Um, uh, that's how it should read. If God were to exist, then he would not have permitted there to be as much non-belief in God and in the afterlife among humans as there actually is. Um, I'll come back to a discussion of the argument from non-belief. Let me first um, make some statements about the argument from evil. This is a very familiar argument. Probably most of you have heard it before. The question might be raised as to how God might have brought about the situation of less suffering and less premature death. One way would have been for him to make the earth a calmer and more stable planet with fewer storms, earthquakes, and volcanic eruptions. Another way would have been for God to make people hardier and more resistant to germs and other afflictions. It might be objected that a significant reduction in premature deaths would soon lead to overpopulation. But being all-powerful, God could have done things to prevent overpopulation in a humane way. For example, while making humans less subject to premature death, he could also have given them genes that make women increasingly less fertile the more times they give birth, thereby preventing very large families. That would bring about the situation of less suffering in a way that would not introduce additional problems down the road. Another way for God to have brought about less suffering would have been for him to uh, guide mutations in such a way that a greater percentage of them are beneficial to the organism. That would have um, eliminated much unnecessary suffering that occurred down through the centuries as evolution took place. God could also have made organisms, especially humans, smarter than they are. That would have given them a better means for coping with evil than they presently have. In addition, God could have made people more altruistic than they are. Had he done that, there would be much less crime and cruelty in the world. God could also have provided people with better evidence of his own existence. That in itself would have to some extent inclined them away from moral evil, which in turn would have made for a better world. Well, obviously, there are a great many ways in which God, assuming he exists, could have brought about the situation of less suffering. Now, I want to claim that this premise one, which is in your program, God, by definition, is, among other things, an all-loving deity who strongly desires love and worship from humans and who wants everyone to be aware of his existence. This is supported in Scripture. And I think it's also the, the most common concept of God among people, at least in this country. So I think that this definition uh, can be regarded as adequate for our purposes and well-supported. Consider now the inference from step one to step two. I want to give an analogy. Suppose a man is not at home and his wife and children are destitute and so ill as to be close to death. They are in great need of help. It is known that the man loves his family very much. It is also known that if he were alive, then he would be a man of great wealth and power and would be aware of his family's unfortunate situation. The inference is drawn that if the man were alive, then he would have done something to help his family. This is a strong inductive inference. It is analogous to the inference from one to two in the argument from evil. 
which I also take to be a strong inductive inference. Granted, it is logically possible that the man may be alive and yet not help his family, even though he is aware of their unfortunate situation and is able to help them and loves them very much. But though possible, we deem that situation highly unlikely. People who love others and are able to help them do so. They do not sit back and watch their loved ones suffer and die. This applies to the inference from one to two. It is assumed that in one, God is all-powerful and all-knowing, as well as all-loving. <clears throat> so given all that, how could God permit so many people, especially children, to suffer and die as occurs in our world? It seems highly unlikely that he would permit that to happen if, in, if indeed he were to exist. I hope that Dr. Craig will address this question of why God permits so many children to uh, suffer and, uh, and die. And also the question of why God doesn't do something to make his existence clearly evident to everyone, since that would cut down on moral evil. Now I turn to the argument from non-belief. It's the same first premise, but the next step is different. If God were to exist, then he would not have permitted there to be as much non-belief in God and in the afterlife among humans as there actually is. Well, how could he have affected that? One way would have been direct implantation of the given beliefs into people's minds, perhaps like in the case of Adam and Eve. Another way would have been for God to um, perform spectacular miracles. For example, God could have spoken to people in a thunderous voice from the sky or used sky writing to proclaim he exists and there's an afterlife. And maybe uh, the gospel message could have been written in the sky as well. Furthermore, back in the days of Jesus, events could have occurred differently. Instead of appearing only to his followers, the resurrected Christ could have appeared to millions of people, including Pontius Pilate and Emperor Tiberius and others in Rome. And uh, this too would have made a big difference in world history. God could also have brought about greater belief without resort to spectacular miracles. He could have done it through the use of angels behind the scenes. He could have um, done a better job of protecting the Bible uh, from um, mistakes and errors. Uh, one last way is, is this. Um, he could have used the internet. <laughs> Those who browse the World Wide Web could regularly receive the gospel message, uh, perhaps even if they try to avoid it. God could flame all and only non-believers were sitting at their computers by, by warning them of future judgment. CDs could fall from the sky <laughs> for use uh, with the CD-ROM drives. Um, it could proclaim the gospel message in spectacular sounds and colors. Um, so, I mean, this is the information age. I mean, there's no problem for God to get the word out. Um, now, I want to comment on this, the last part of premise one. It says that God wants everyone to be aware of his existence. I, I want to say that this is well supported in the Bible. The Bible commanded people to believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. The Bible commanded people to love God maximally. It seems to me that in order to love God maximally, you have to believe he exists. So God must want people to believe that he exists. He has the Great Commission in which he sent out missionaries to the world to, uh, to preach the gospel message. He must want people to believe he exists and that there is an afterlife and that the gospel message is true, at least according to the Bible. It says that, <clears throat> um, well, Jesus says in, in John 18.37, For this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Presumably the truth here referred to includes God's existence and the existence of an afterlife. 
at least as an important component. It follows that an important part of the mission of Jesus was to testify to the truth of a message that includes God's existence and the existence of an afterlife. There are many, many other passages from scripture that could be used to support this premise. Finally, I want to put forward an argument for it that makes no reference to the Bible. Almost all theists, at least those in the US, regard God as a being who loves humanity and who wants that love to be reciprocated. That is, God wants to have some sort of fellowship with humanity. So conceived in that way, God must want people to be aware that he exists and that out of love for humanity, he has, he has provided people with an opportunity for a blissful afterlife. He must want people to believe that. It would benefit people to be aware of all that, for it would provide them with comfort and hope for the future. Since God loves people, he must want them to attain such a benefit. Awareness of the truth of God's existence and the existence of an afterlife would help people reciprocate God's love, which God also desires. And also it would help people to be moral if they knew for sure that he exists and that there's an afterlife. I would like to put to Dr. Craig the question, why hasn't God <clears throat> provided people with better evidence for his existence and for the existence of an afterlife? By, by better evidence, I mean evidence that would be sufficient to show it to just about everybody in the world so that uh, the whole world would, would believe in a God who has provided an afterlife and perhaps who has, has saved humanity through his son and, and so on. Why hasn't God um, given people that information? Okay, I'd like to turn to a brief consideration of Dr. Craig's five arguments. For each of them, I, I have, a, first of all, this objection, that the, the concept of God is hard to understand, especially when God is defined as a timeless, changeless, non-material person. So it seems to me that, that this is a kind of meaningless jargon. It, it's like a, a little boy who asked his father, how come Santa Claus could bring so many toys to so many children all in one night? I mean, how could he fit through all those narrow chimneys and there are millions of kids out there? I mean, how, how can he do it? This is the father's reply. Santa operates through the fifth dimension. The kid said, ah, now I understand. So this, this information is then spread among the children in the neighborhood. You know, now, you know, they had doubts, no more. It, it seems to me that, that Dr. Craig's talk about a being who is timeless and changeless and um, a non-material person, it, it seems to me that it's like that. It's analogous to that. So it, it doesn't really explain the things that he says it explains. In his formulation of the, the five arguments, we're skipping the first one here, says God makes sense of the origin of the universe. I, I think he should say the existence of the universe just to leave open at that point the option that the universe might be beginningless. Um, and, and by the way, that second one, I think, shouldn't read God makes sense of the complex order in the universe. It should be God makes sense of the particular combination of physical constants that obtains in the universe. Because, I mean, other combinations may be just as complex. So it, that's really the thing to be explained. And then the third one, God makes sense of objective moral values in the world. I, I don't think objective moral values are a fact to be explained. It's not a given datum. So I don't see how one could set up the argument in that way. If God is going to be the best explanation for something, that needs to be a datum. And the existence of objective moral values, that's a philosophical theory. That, that's not a datum. Dr. Craig first needs to prove that there are objective moral values before he can claim that to be a datum to be explained. As for the resurrection of, of Jesus, it seems to me that 
There he's uh, illegitimately assuming the Bible to be historical fact. Now you notice I make use of the Bible, but, but I don't assume it to be historical fact, and it seems to me illegitimate to do that, because think of the context in which this debate is occurring. We're appealing to neutral people. We're putting forward arguments for and against God's existence to people who are neutral without any assumptions on the matter. We can't assume that the resurrection of Jesus is a historical fact to be explained. So it, uh, it's illegitimate to say this is the best explanation for a certain fact, namely the resurrection of Jesus. The, the final one, um, Dr. Craig admits is not an argument, and it, it doesn't seem to me to be an argument. It, atheists could have experiences too. I would like to ask him what he would make of uh, atheist experiences if, if they were reported to him. Um, why wouldn't they be just as legitimate as theistic experiences? Uh, I spoke to an atheist the other day who said that he looked up at the sky and he, he directly apprehended God's non-existence. Um, and um, I, I would like to know how uh, Dr. Craig would respond. Well, anyway, I, I also have a, a bunch of uh, alternative explanations for these various things, and maybe I could run through a, a few of them. Um, with regard to the existence of the universe, it seems to me there are alternate explanations. It, it could be beginningless, despite all that he says. I'm not convinced by his a priori arguments. It seems to me that if God could be beginningless, then the universe could be. Um, Another explanation is that time began with the universe. So if, if time began with the universe, then, then that was just the absolute beginning of everything. It, the universe didn't come out of nothingness, as he put it. He says, out of nothing, nothing comes, and you know, so throws that out. But really, if time in the universe began, there's, there's no way to even talk about before the universe. Because before the universe means, you know, there was some time before the universe. If time began at that point, there wasn't any before. It was just an absolute beginning. And in that case, there's no need for any cause. It just began, and that's all. So that would be another model that, that could be suggested. A third model would be some greater universe, like a hyper-universe. And the, our universe could be like a bubble that grows on the outside of a hyper-universe, with the, um, the explanation for its origin being within the laws of the hyper-universe, which, which we don't understand because we don't have any cognizance of that. Uh, it seems to me that that explanation is at least as good as the God hypothesis. I would like to know why the uh, God hypothesis should be preferable to the appeal to a hyper-universe, out of which our universe is an outgrowth. Um, well, I have alternate explanations for all of these um, arguments that Dr. Craig has put forward, and uh, uh, perhaps um, I'm, I'm about out of time, so I guess I'll have to uh, postpone giving some of these other alternate explanations to uh, the next phase, which will be my rebuttal period. Um, I'd like to mention one thing. If anybody would like to obtain a copy of my manuscript, you could contact me either by email, there's an email address given in the program, or you could get my university address after the meeting tonight, I would gladly supply it. I have um, my manuscript and a supplement to it. Some of those are for sale out at the uh, lobby, um, but if there aren't any left, you could contact me and I will tell you how you might obtain them. All right, thank you very much. Now, you'll remember in my first speech, I said I was going to argue that there are no good reasons to think that atheism is true. So let's look at this time uh, at Dr. Drange's two arguments. First, the argument from evil. 
I want to suggest that this is simply an invalid argument. That is to say, premise two does not follow from premise one. There's no rule of logic which will allow you to infer that because God is all loving, that therefore he would have prevented the suffering in the world. So the argument is simply invalid. But let's consider uh, premise two on its own merits. Is it true that God would have prevented the suffering in the world? Well, I think this is far from obvious. In uh, Dr. Drange's published version, he admits that his argument hinges upon the assumption that God would not want anything else more than he wants to prevent evil. But how does Dr. Drange know that? Isn't that a little bit presumptuous on his part? In fact, in his article, he admits, and I quote, it is a highly debatable matter whether any good support can be given for the truth of that premise. And therefore, he concludes that it's really an inconclusive argument. And in fact, I think it's plausible that what God wants most is for people to believe in him and be saved. But maybe only in a world involving a considerable amount of natural and moral evil would the maximum number of people freely come to believe in him. And this isn't some idle speculation on my part. As you look at the places in the world today where evangelical Christianity is growing at its most rapid rates, you'll find this correlated with places of intense suffering, places like China, Ethiopia, and El Salvador. The point is that Dr. Drange, I think, has no idea of how many people would come to freely know God and his salvation if God were to have prevented the evil and suffering in the world. But then Dr. Drange simply has no uh, grounds for the assertion that if God exists, he would have prevented the evil in the world. And therefore, this argument, I think, is simply fallacious. Now, what about his argument from non-belief? Well, it is also invalid. Premise four doesn't follow from premise one. From the fact that God wants people to love and believe in him, it doesn't follow that God would have prevented the non-belief in the world. Here, I want to make two points. First, it may not be within God's power to bring it about that most people freely believe in the truth of the gospel message. It is logically impossible to make someone freely do something. So God can't make somebody freely believe in the truth of the gospel message. So what Dr. Drange is asking for, God's making most people in the world freely believe in the truth of the gospel, may well be infeasible for God. Now remember, he's not talking about God's just making most people in the world aware of the gospel message. God's already done that. According to Patrick Johnstone, a missiologist, between 75 and 85 percent of the world's population has already been reached with the gospel. So, uh, but Dr. Drange is talking about making most people believe that the gospel message is true. And God simply can't guarantee or make people freely believe something. So what four envisions in his argument may simply be infeasible for God. Second point I want to make. Dr. Drange admits in his published article that if God has some other desire which overrides his desire to make people believe that the gospel message is true, then his argument would be defeated. And in fact, I think that God does have such an overriding desire. Namely, his desire that people should freely come to love and believe in him. This is not the same thing as people's believing the gospel message is true. Uh, as the Bible says, even the demons believe that the gospel message is true, and yet they tremble with fear. Believing that something is true is not the same thing as believing in someone. Believing that certain propositions about God are true isn't the same thing as believing in God. Now, Dr. Drange might say uh, at this point, okay, okay, but look, God's desire that most people freely love and believe in him entails his desire that most people would believe in the truth of the gospel message. But I think that's simply false. That entailment is wrong. What is true is that God desires that those persons who would freely believe in him if they heard the gospel message, that those persons should hear the gospel message and believe it to be true. But I can't think of any reason why God would want people to believe in the truth of the gospel message if he knew that they wouldn't respond affirmatively to it and uh, accept it if they heard it. That would be just like getting all worked up about applying one part of a two-part epoxy glue if you knew you didn't have the other part. 
Uh, just believing that the gospel message is true is useless unless it's coupled with a response of faith and love. And God cannot guarantee that people will freely love him and believe in him. So, in, in short, it just doesn't follow that because God wants all people to love and believe in him, that he would have made most people freely believe that the gospel message is true. In the first place, it may not be feasible for God to make most people freely believe the gospel message is true. Secondly, there's no reason to think that God would want people to believe the gospel message is true if he also knew that they would not respond affirmatively to it if they did hear it. And therefore this argument from non-belief it seems to me is just completely invalid and uh, therefore there's really no good reason that's been given tonight to think atheism is true. Now, what about the arguments that I gave to suggest that theism is true? First, God makes sense of the origin of the universe. Here Dr. Drange raises a number of points. First he says to talk about timeless persons is meaningless jargon. Well, if he's going to maintain that, I challenge him to give me a proof of it. He's got the burden of proof if he's going to say that, and I see no incoherence in the concept of a timeless person. This has been uh, given considerable philosophical analysis, for example, by John Yates in his book, The Timelessness of God. This is what Yates says. The theist may immediately grant that concepts such as memory and anticipation could not apply to a timeless being, but this is not to admit that the key concepts of consciousness and knowledge are inapplicable to such a deity. There does not seem to be any essential temporal element in words like to understand, to be aware, to know. An atemporal deity could possess maximal understanding, awareness, and knowledge in a single, all-embracing vision of reality. So I see no incoherence in the concept of a timeless personal being that created the universe. Well, Dr. Drange then raises three objections. He says, number one, the universe could be beginningless, like God. Two points. Number one, the universe can't be beginningless. He's got to refute my philosophical argument against the actual infinite. And besides, the empirical evidence indicates that the universe began to exist. According to Stephen Hawking in his most recent book, The Nature of Space and Time, 1996, almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. Secondly, he says, well, if time did begin, there wasn't any before, so the universe doesn't really come into existence. I think he's just incorrect there. Certainly, there is no before prior to the beginning of time. That would be self-contradictory. But the universe does come into existence in the sense that it comes to exist at t equals zero and that it did not exist before that. And therefore, it needs to have some sort of a cause. As uh, Barrow and Tipler point out in their book, The Anthropic Cosmological Principle, at this singularity, space and time came into existence. Literally nothing existed before the singularity. So if the universe originated at such a singularity, we would truly have a creation ex nihilo, that is, out of nothing. Thirdly, he says, well, perhaps the universe is part of a hyper-universe and we're just a bubble within it. I assume he's referring here to vacuum fluctuation models of the universe, and I want to suggest that these were abandoned in the 1970s because in these models there is a non-zero probability that a universe would come to exist at every point in the quantum vacuum of hyperspace and that therefore, given infinite past time, these universes would begin to collide with each other and coalesce into one infinitely old universe, which contradicts observation. So according to Christopher Isham, a quantum cosmologist at the Empirical College of Science and Technology in London, this difficulty, he says, is fairly lethal to vacuum fluctuation models, and he says, therefore, they were jettisoned 20 years ago, and nothing much has been done with them since. So I don't see any way around this argument, really, frankly, from the atheist point of view. You just got to say the universe popped into being out of nothing, which I think takes more faith than to believe in a creator. Secondly, I argued that God makes sense of the complex order in the universe. He didn't respond to the point except to say you've got to say he makes sense of the particular complex order. What I'm arguing is that God makes sense of the life-permitting initial conditions of the universe. Notice Dr. Drange didn't deny their improbability. He's got to say this just happened by chance, which seems to me to be uh, just uh, almost virtually irrational to believe that something like that just popped into existence that way. Third, God makes sense of objective moral values in the world. 
Here he seems to deny that objective moral values exist. And I would submit that that's simply contrary to our best moral intuitions. As Michael Roos himself admits, the man who says that it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five. Will Dr. Drange get up and actually say that he thinks that the rape and torture of a child is a morally neutral act? I can't believe that he would. As John Healy, the executive director of Amnesty International, has written, he says, I think you share my profound belief that there are some moral absolutes. When it comes to torture, government-sanctioned murder, to disappearances, there are no lesser evils. These are outrageous against all of us. But on the atheistic evolutionary scenario, moral values are just the spin-offs of sociobiological evolution. They're not objective. If you agree with me, that objective moral values exist, then it follows logically that God exists. Fourth, God makes sense of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Dr. Jane simply responded, will you assume that the Bible is a historical fact? No, I don't assume this. In every case, I appeal to the consensus of critical scholarship today for the facts of the empty tomb, the resurrection appearances, and the origin of the Christian faith. And I want to emphasize, this is not the conclusion of evangelical or conservative scholars. This is the consensus of the broad mainstream of New Testament critics. Any responsible historian dealing with the life of Jesus has to deal with those three established facts, and I can't think of any better explanation for them than the fact of the resurrection. Finally, God can be immediately known and experienced. The problem with atheist experiences is that we have defeaters of those experiences. We've seen that there aren't any good reasons to think atheism is true. But in the absence of any reason to think theism is false, I don't see why I should deny my immediate experience of God. It seems to me to give uh, perfectly rational grounds for me to believe that my experience is veridical and that God exists. Dr. Craig questions the inference from step one to step two in the argument from evil. This is a probabilistic inference. Notice step two begins, hence probably. So it's, uh, it's not supposed to be a logically valid inference, simply a strong inductive argument. I use the analogy of the uh, father who is away from his family. Uh, we, we reason that, that probably, since he loves his family and he has all this power and wealth, if he were aware, <coughs> uh, or if he were alive, uh, then uh, he would have done something to help them. And this, this seems to me to be a reasonable inductive argument. And the uh, argument that I have here, the argument from evil, is uh, perfectly analogous to that. I don't think that Dr. Craig answered my question uh, specifically as to why God permits so many children in the world to suffer and die. He talks about freely believing. I don't really understand that. It seems to me that you believe in accord with the evidence and you, you don't just uh, choose your beliefs as an act of, by an act of will. I think God can make people aware of the truth of the gospel message. He, he seems to question that. First of all, in order for people to freely love God, which is presumably what God wants, their love and some kind of reciprocation from them, they must first believe that God exists. They must be in that situation. So. My question is, why doesn't God at least place everybody in the world in the situation of being totally aware of his existence and the existence of an afterlife, and then, at that point, they can make their choice whether to love God or not, whether to accept Jesus or not. As long as they're not in the situation of being aware of God's existence, they, they're not even in a position where they could make a sensible choice about such matters. I think God must want people to believe in his existence because he wants their love, he wants reciprocation from them, and because he loves them and wants them to be aware of the truth, he, he wants them to gain the, the comfort of knowing that he exists and that there is an afterlife because this would benefit them. There's also the point about salvation. 
It seems to me that uh, this is something that uh, Dr. Craig should address. Is it really true that people who do not believe in God are going to be eternally damned? It seems to me if that is true, then that would be another very, very powerful reason for God to want people to be aware of his existence. Because surely he doesn't want them to be eternally damned. So I would pose this as another question for Dr. Craig. Is it, is it true that uh, all those who have heard of Christianity say, uh, but have, have not accepted it, maybe because they didn't get adequate evidence for it, um, all those people are eternally damned. Uh, I would like to know that. Now, on the matter of, of his arguments, I didn't really uh, get into them. I, I ran out of time. For, as for God being a, uh, a timeless, changeless person, it seems to me that that still, for all he says, is very obscure and hard to understand. And it seems to me to be contrary to the uh, biblical concept of God. Uh, the biblical concept certainly is of a God who, who uh, changes his mind and, and acts in time or within time. Uh, Genesis 6, 6 says that God regretted having created humans. And in Exodus 32, God told Moses he planned to kill a group of Israelites, but Moses pleaded for them. And it reads, and the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. In 1 Samuel, God regretted having made Saul king over Israel. In 2 Kings, God conveyed the message that Hezekiah was about to die. But Isaiah prayed for Hezekiah, and as a result, God added 15 more years to his life. In, in the book of Jonah, God saw that the people of Nineveh had genuinely repented, and as a consequence, he changed his mind about destroying them. So the biblical God certainly changes his mind about things, performs actions within time. So that, that isn't a timeless, changeless being. Uh, I don't see that, that the God that he's defending here, this, this timeless being who was supposed to be somehow the, the cause of, of the universe and the cause of time in some way, that that's the, uh, uh, the God of Christian theism. It's, uh, it seems to be too abstract and remote for that. And as for God causing time, I don't understand what it is to cause time. When you think of what cause means, to say X causes Y means X was there before Y. The cause has to precede the effect. The effect must come after the cause. So it's impossible for time to have a cause. That is, if time began, which he seems to think it did, uh, it could not have had a cause in anything like the, the ordinary sense. Um, I think that with regard to my various models, the, the empirical evidence is compatible with them, and, and scientists have supported all the models that I uh, mentioned. He, he says these models were discarded in the past. That, that isn't true. There are scientists today who still opt for them, and there are new discoveries made in cosmology every year. It's, it's a very rapidly growing and changing field. He seems to think it has been fixed at some, some, in some way, and that isn't so. I'd like to address this fine-tuning argument that he, he brings up. Um, apart from the, the fact that I, I don't think the God hypothesis is a good explanation for the physical constants of the universe, because I, I find it to be too obscure to be a good explanation for anything, it being supernaturalistic and outside science, and, and we prefer naturalistic explanations, I, I think there are alternate explanations for the physical constants of the universe. One, for one thing, scientists are trying to discover a unified field theory or, or a theory of everything, and they feel that when they discover this, this will explain why the physical constants of the universe had to be the way they are, or what they are. That once this is known, this is something that is ongoing, and scientists are working on it. They're trying to explain why the physical constants of the universe have to be the way they are. 
And once that comes out, then uh, Dr. Craig's kind of reasoning doesn't apply because he's saying, oh, they could have been this, they could have been that, they could have been anything. Well, that may just not be the case. Now, another explanation is simply that it's a brute fact that the constants are the way they are. Um, he would say, well, that's not good because that doesn't explain why it is that the universe has life in it. To just say it's a brute fact, it makes it sound like it's just a stroke of luck that we happen to be living in a universe that uh, was able to give rise to life. But I I'm wondering whether other combinations of physical constants might have given rise to other interesting things. Maybe not life as we know it. Maybe some other forms of mind. Perhaps he would grant that there could be a uh, mind uh, even though the physical constants of the universe are different. Uh, my reason for thinking that is that he, he regards God to be a mind and God is independent of the universe, independent of the constants, so it seems to me then he must agree that mind is independent of the physical constants of the universe and so the constants could have been other than they are and there could still be mind in, in some form. Maybe not life as we know it, but there could have been some kind of thinking going on. There might have been other interesting things going on. Who knows? How, how can he show us that other combinations of constants would produce universes that are dull, uninteresting compared to ours, so that ours is special and in need of explanation? So we have to explain why uh, the universe gave uh, rise to, to life. Well, look, if there had been some other combination of constants, it seems to me that um, that might have produced something interesting, and then there would be the explanation about why did that occur. There could be a billion combinations, and each of them might give rise to something interesting. So it's just a brute fact that our universe um, uh, is the way it is. And it, there's no need for any further explanation beyond that. Uh, another idea is that there might be other universes with uh, other combinations of constants. I, I've read this, that um, there are many worlds. And we live in one world with one combination, and we have our interesting things going on. And there are other combinations elsewhere with their interesting things going on. And, well, why is ours the way it is? Well, we happened to grow and evolve into this world. It was suitable for us. We adapted to it, and, and that explains that. So it seems to me there are a number of alternate models and explanations that could be given here. As for the moral argument, I would like to suggest two alternate explanations, not, not for objective moral values necessarily, uh, but just for the fact that people have moral feelings and moral intuitions. Moral feelings may be genetically based. It could be that most people have cooperative instincts which were passed on by heredity and which play an important evolutionary role. Those cooperative instincts incline people towards moral behavior and lead them to have certain likes and dislikes regarding human conduct, which they express by means of moral judgments. There may be a few people who lack uh, such cooperative instincts, and they're called sociopaths, but we could disregard them, like we, we might disregard colorblind people in, in discussing colors. So the reason why people, for the most part, agree about morality, which, which seems to give rise to the idea of objective moral values, um, is that they share the same genetic influences on their likes and dislikes with regard to human conduct. Another explanation is that moral feelings are the product of social conditioning. It is certainly in the interest of social groups to have their members behave morally. And so all such groups employ reinforcement techniques to induce their children to behave morally. As the reinforcement occurs over time, the children come to internalize the moral rules that are being reinforced. That leads them to have moral feelings and moral intuitions, which explains the, the facts in question. The facts being, why is it that people have moral feelings and moral intuitions uh, 
It could be that there are objective moral values, but it doesn't have to be. And even if we say that there are objective moral values, it doesn't seem to me that we have to make any appeal to God. We can appeal to these considerations regarding genetics, intuition, we are, apprehend the moral truths, genetics inclines us towards apprehending these truths. We need not go beyond that. Thank you. Let's look first at my contention that there's no good reason to think atheism is true. In response to the argument from evil, I pointed out that Dr. Drange himself admits that if God has an overriding desire, uh, then his argument is fallacious. And I said he does have an overriding desire, namely his desire that people would freely come to, uh, to love and believe in him. And maybe it's only in a world in which there is gratuitous, natural, and moral suffering that the maximum number of people would freely come to believe in God. And he said in response, but my is just a probabilistic inference. Right, I understand that. And I'm suggesting that my hypothesis is in no way improbable, that on the contrary, it's actually supported by the demographics of world history and uh, contemporary missiology. That very often it is in the context of suffering that people come to know and believe in God. And God's purposes in human history are being achieved. So given that overriding desire, I just don't see any teeth to the problem of evil argument. What about the argument from non-belief? I argued here that God can't make people freely believe in the truth of the gospel message, and that secondly, even if he could, that uh, God can't guarantee that everyone who believes in the truth of the gospel message would respond to it in the proper way and believe and love him. Uh, and that given God's inability to do that, to guarantee that, uh, it may well be that in, the, in this world God does bring it about that those who would believe in the truth of the gospel message and place their trust and faith in him do in fact do so. And what Dr. Drange responded was simply by giving us more motivations for God to make people believe in the truth of the gospel message. For example, that people might go to hell, that uh, they need to uh, learn uh, about his existence and so forth. I admit all of that, that God could be motivated to do that, but the point is that Dr. Drange has failed to show that there are any people in the world who would respond affirmatively to the existence of God if they had sufficient evidence, who don't have such evidence. I'm suggesting that God is in, in his providence and omniscience is capable of so ordering the world as to achieve an optimal balance between belief and unbelief in the world. And Dr. Drange is just purely speculating when he says that in a world of free creatures, God could have guaranteed a better balance between belief and unbelief than the balance that exists in the actual world. How does he know that? It's just pure speculation. So I see, again, just no validity to this argument from non-belief. In fact, I must say, in a sense, this argument is, is, with all due respect, almost a joke. It's the ultimate in buck passing. It's saying that uh, God is the one who's responsible for the fact that so many people don't believe in him. Uh, really, the responsibility lies with us. God's existence, I think, is evident in nature and conscience all around us. And it's the ultimate passing of the buck to say, well, now we're going to blame God for why we don't believe in him. In fact, this argument, if it were valid, would uh, be a means of making sure God doesn't exist. We'll all conspire together not to believe in God, and then he can't exist, based on the argument from non-belief. So I, I just don't see any validity to it. Now, what about the reasons to think that theism is true? First, God makes sense of the origin of the universe. Dr. Drange says, but the Bible, biblical God is temporal. Uh, well, two responses. Number one, many of those passages could simply be anthropomorphisms, that is, describing God in human terms, storytelling terms. Secondly, the theist could maintain that with the creation of the universe, God enters into time in order to sustain temporal relations with his creatures. Dr. Drange says, but what is it to cause something? A cause must exist before its effect. That's false. There's such a thing as simultaneous causation. For example, a heavy ball causing a depression in a cushion by resting on the cushion. Even if the ball and the cushion had been in that state from eternity past, the ball would still be the cause of the depression. A cause can be simultaneous with its effect. God's causing the universe is simultaneous with the moment of the Big Bang. 
He then said it's not true, contrary to what Professor Christopher Isham says, that these vacuum fluctuation models are passe. Uh, and he said uh, that the field of com cosmology is rapidly growing. Well, that's certainly a truism. But if he's going to oppose some other model to the standard Big Bang model, I want to know what it is, and I will then offer some refutation of it. But so far, he's just spoken in generalities. The fact is that vacuum fluctuation models don't work because of the problem that I described in my last speech. And notice, on the atheistic view, there isn't any explanation for the origin of the universe, why something exists rather than nothing. It's just a brute fact that the universe popped into being, uncaused out of nothing, 15 billion years ago. To me, that is, that is just incredible. Secondly, I said that God makes sense of the complex order of the universe. Here, Dr. Drange says, your explanation of intelligent design is too obscure. Not at all. When you're walking uh, in the field or on a beach and you find a watch lying on the beach, you don't say, oh, look how the elements have come together by chance to form this device. You immediately recognize the presence of intelligent design. And the same complexity present in the watch is present in the fine-tuning of the universe. He says, but there could be a theory of everything in which everything is explained. That, friends, is a pipe dream. There is no probability that exists today that such a theory will ever be discovered. And even if there were some sort of theory of everything, it would still require certain initial conditions, boundary conditions of the universe, that would be unexplained and would need to be put in by hand. He said, well, maybe there could be other conditions that would give rise to other forms of life. Well, I don't think so when you understand what the fine-tuning involves. If the universe had just a different expansion parameter, it would have re-collapsed into a, a singularity in which no life could exist. Or it would have expanded too fast and been frozen so that it would be too cold for life. Or there wouldn't have been any chemistry. Or there wouldn't have been any atoms to form life. The point is that even if mind could exist, there could be no physical carbon-based intelligence life in a universe in which these parameters were altered in the slightest bit. We live on a knife's edge of incomprehensible fineness, which I think suggests intelligent fine-tuning. Dr. Drange said, well, maybe there's many worlds and we're just one of many universes. Let me point out three things about this. Number one, that is a metaphysical hypothesis, which is every bit as speculative as theism is, and therefore no, enjoys no advantage over theism. In fact, I think theism is simpler than this bloated ontology of the many worlds hypothesis and is therefore to be preferred. Secondly, there is no known mechanism that would generate such a world ensemble. And any mechanism for generating it would itself require fine-tuning in order to get the many worlds. And finally, number three, there is no independent evidence apart from the existence of intelligent life for the existence of these many worlds, whereas we have many independent reasons for believing in God. And it is the cumulative case that I believe makes the existence of God so plausible. What about objective moral values in the world? Dr. Drange says, well, maybe our moral feelings are based on genetic and social factors. That is absolutely correct on the atheistic view. It's just social and genetic conditioning. It's the herd morality. But I ask you, just do you believe that the rape and torture of a little child is not objectively morally wrong? That the psychopath who does that is just acting antisocially or against his genes? I don't think so. I think that we have a moral intuition that it is morally better to love and nurture a child than to torture it and abuse it. And if you share those intuitions with me, then I think you'll agree that God exists. There was no refutation offered in the last speech of the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, nor of the immediate experience of God in our lives today. So I think we have powerful cumulative evidence for believing that God does in fact exist. It would help people believe in God if he were to reduce their suffering and not make the world into such a place where it, it seems unlikely that a loving ruler exists. He didn't really address the point about salvation. I, I would like to know whether all these uh, non-Christians in the world, according to him, I mean, there, there are billions of them, does he really think that they are all are going to be eternally tormented in hell. Um, surely God must want everyone to believe, just to avoid hell. It, even if he's provided evidence and uh, they haven't picked up on it, uh, he, he should say to them, those adults, they need more. And he should provide more. 
uh, just to get them to escape uh, eternal torment in hell. I mean, he shouldn't be reluctant. He shouldn't hold back. I would like to know why it is that uh, so many people in Asia uh, are non-Christian. I mean, Dr. Craig seems to say that, well, those who are somehow ready for it, God supplies them with the evidence. And the other people, he knows he can read their hearts. He doesn't, he doesn't bother with them. But why so many in Asia get left out and so many in this country uh, are given the evidence to become Christians? He says that God is evident in nature and God is evident in conscience. I don't see that that is so. How is God evident in nature? You mean this uh, abstract appeal to the origin of the universe? Uh, this abstract appeal to the combination of physical constants in the universe? Uh, what does he mean by evident in nature? And evident in conscience? No, we can explain conscience in other ways. It could be that people have a genetic disposition to want to cooperate with one another, and that would explain conscience. God certainly could do more to help people believe. Um, Dr. Craig says it's the people's fault for not believing, but I don't see that it's the people's fault. Uh, certainly, um, if God were to uh, do sky writing or something like that, at least the basic message could get out. Everybody would believe in God, and then they could make a choice whether to follow Jesus or not. As long as they are non-believers in God, they're not even in a position where they could make the kind of choice that the Christians want them, I mean, to be in that position that the Christians want them to be in, whether to choose or deny. Okay, now to go over to his arguments, he, he says that there could be such a thing as simultaneous causation. He gives the example of the bowling ball on top of the pillow. Um, I don't see that that's simultaneous causation. I mean, you put a bowling ball on a pillow, presses it down. The, uh, you, you, you could think of a layer of molecules. There's the bowling ball molecules and the pillow molecules. Well, there's the, the bottom bowling ball mo molecule that comes in contact with the top pillow molecule and that molecule presses down on the pillow molecule which presses another pillow molecule which presses another and so on. It seems to me that the cause is coming before the effect there. The, the uh, force from the bowling ball molecules comes first and exerts downward pressure and that causes the uh, pillow molecules to be depressed. So that isn't simultaneous causation at all. That's cause coming before effect, which is our common concept of causality. He talks about the statue in the sand. We, we find a statue in the sand, we say, well, that couldn't have come by chance. But why is that? It's, it's because we have some knowledge of these things. We, we know about statues and we know about sand. And that's why we say it couldn't have come about by chance. But we don't know these things in the case of the formation of the physical constants of the universe. We, we don't have the relevant background information to make that kind of judgment. He says that my alternate hypotheses are not better than his God hypothesis. But remember, my alternate hypotheses do not need to be better. They only need to be at least as good. All I need is one alternate hypothesis that is at least as good as the God hypothesis, and that shows that his proof does not go through. Because in order for his proof to go through, he has to show that the God hypothesis is better than all the others. It's the best explanation. And as long as there's one other hypothesis at least as good, then his proof is a failure. Um, he talks about a cumulative case. He says he's got all these in independent uh, uh, sources of evidence about God and they all somehow come together. But I, I don't understand that because, okay, he, suppose his argument for uh, a cause of the universe, suppose that goes through. So he, he shows that there's some kind of being that caused the universe. All right, now he's got another argument for a, a cause for the, um, the physical constants being the way they are. Okay, maybe there's a being that did that. And then he's got a, somehow a cause for objective morality. He's got a being that caused that. Um, 
and then he's got a cause for the resurrection that brought Jesus back to life. What I want to know is why believe that all of these beings, this one, this one, this one, this one, that they're all one and the same being? Where is his argument to show that all of these beings are the one and the same being? It's only when he can prove that, that he's got a cumulative case for the existence of God. Now, so far as objective moral value is concerned, I, I want to say that it's possible to believe in objective moral value and still deny God's existence. I want to say also that there are good reasons for a subjectivist view on, on values. For one thing, there's no objective proof procedure for settling moral disputes, and that supports a subjectivist outlook. Also, moral properties are not given to us in sense perception. They, they aren't like physical properties, and that's another reason to think that subjectivism is true. He talks about rape and so on, but what about some other examples like, like these? Uh, abortion. Uh, what is the objective moral truth there? What about homosexuality? What is the objective moral truth there? I mean, let him tell us. He says there are objective moral values, you know, absolutes, uh, ethical absolutes. What are they in these examples here? Premarital sex. Is that objectively absolutely wrong? How about cruelty to animals, which is condoned in the Bible? Also child abuse. Divorce and remarriage, which are considered morally wrong in the Bible. Uh, are divorce and remarriage ob objectively morally wrong? In the Bible it says it's, it's wrong for wives to disobey their husbands. Is that objectively wrong? Um, uh, slavery is condoned. So what is the uh, objective truth about that? It says idolatry is wrong and heresy and blasphemy, working on the Sabbath and so on. What is the objective moral truth of that? Time's up, sorry. In my closing speech, I want to review the debate and uh, see which issues come out as the foremost issues tonight. First, have we seen any good reason to think that atheism is true? Well, I don't think so. First, the argument from evil. In his last speech, Dr. Drange asserted, well, it would help people to believe in God if he were to reduce the suffering in the world. That is precisely the point that Dr. Drange has to prove, and he hasn't proven it. In fact, I submit that the demographic information that we have in the world today suggests that that is false. As Patrick Johnston points out in his book, Operation World, we are living in the time of the largest ingathering of people into the kingdom of God that the world has ever seen. The astonishing growth in Africa and Asia today more than counterbalances the decline in the Western world. And he points out that it is precisely in places in the world like El Salvador and Ethiopia where there has been intense suffering that the greatest advances in the growth of the gospel are occurring. So Dr. Drange is just begging the question when he asserts that in a world with less suffering, more people would come to believe in God. That's question begging. Secondly, what about the argument from non-belief? Again, his argument here boils down to the fact that God wants people to believe in him in order to avoid hell. And I agree with that. The Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish. He wants all to reach repentance. He wants all persons to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And therefore, I argue that God has so ordered the world providentially as to bring about a, an optimal balance between belief and unbelief, including what's going to happen in the future in the actual world. And Dr. Drange has given us no argument whatsoever to think that in a world in which there was skywriting or internet messages, that the balance between belief and unbelief would be any better than the balance in the actual world. He says, well, why is it that the uh, Asians are left out and they're all in the, Christians are all in the West? Again, that just shows his ignorance of contemporary demographics. In 1989, the number of Christians in Asia surpassed the number of Christians in North America. And in 1991, the number of Asians in uh, the number of Christians in Asia surpassed the number of Christians in the entire Western world. Christianity is not a white man's religion. If anything, it's an Asian religion today. So God is reaching the world with the gospel today. Today, there are only about nine unbelievers per evangelical believer in the world today, compared with in the year AD 100, about 360 non-believers for every evangelical believer 
believer in the world. God is achieving the purpose that Dr. Drange uh, would like him to. He is, in fact, bringing the optimal balance of persons to believe in him. So I don't see any grounds for thinking that these are good reasons to think God doesn't exist. Now, what about the reasons I gave for God's existence? First, God makes sense of the origin of the universe. In his last argument, it all boiled down to saying that simultaneous causation is impossible. And that's just clearly a weak argument. The cushion and the ball could have been in contact from eternity. So they could have always been simultaneous with each other. Besides, God isn't a physical object and doesn't have finite velocity of signal transport, so he could immediately cause the Big Bang. Notice there isn't any atheistic alternative. It just pops into existence uncaused out of nothing. It takes more faith to believe that than to believe in God. Second, God makes sense of the complex order of the world. He says, well, in these inferences to intelligent design, we know about these things. That's not true. When you find unknown artifacts uh, archaeologically, or when we look for signals from extraterrestrial intelligent life, we, we can detect the signs of intelligent design without prior awareness of what these uh, elements are. We can discover new machines or new signals from outer space and we would recognize the pres presence of intelligence by complexity, the same sort of complexity that is evident in the fine-tuning of the universe. Dr. Drange says, but I presented other hypotheses that are just as good. I haven't heard them tonight. What hypotheses? The theory of everything? This is in no way as probable as theism. This, this is a pure pipe dream, pure speculation. He hasn't given us any alternative hypotheses to explain the data. What about the existence of objective moral values? Notice that he seems to affirm relativism. He says uh, that there are unclear cases, but notice that unclear cases don't undermine our intuition of the clear cases, like rape. Uh, murder, torture, and so forth. And if you agree there are clear cases, then you need God as a foundation for those. He dropped the point about the resurrection of Jesus. As for the point about knowing God immediately, I just want to close quickly by saying that I myself wasn't raised in a Christian home or a church-going family, but when I became a teenager, I began to read the New Testament. And I found that the words of Jesus had a ring of truth about them that captivated me. And I want to encourage you, when you go home tonight, that you begin to think about these things. Begin to read the New Testament and ask if God couldn't really exist. Uh, I believe it could change your life in the same way that it changed mine. There are these two problems, suffering and non-belief. It seems to me that God could kill two birds with one stone and make a big dent in both problems just by the simple act of showing everybody in the world clearly that he exists. This would reduce a lot of suffering. Why? Because if everybody in the world were to be perfectly clear that God does exist and that there is an afterlife and perhaps also be aware of the truth of the gospel message, it seems to me there would be far less moral evil in the world than there is today. So that would make a big dent in the problem of, of suffering. He also could bring about the thing that he apparently most wants, fellowship with humanity. I, I find it incomprehensible that Dr. Craig should, should say that there's an optimal balance in the world between belief and non-belief. Uh, wherever these non-Christians are, whether they're in Asia, I, th I think they are mostly in Asia, but wherever they are, the fact of the matter is, you can look it up in the World Almanac, two-thirds of the world is non-Christian and only one-third of the world is Christian. So how could that be an optimal balance between belief and non-belief? The non-Christians, according to Dr. Craig, are, are headed for eternal damnation. Um, as for the ball and the pillow, uh, he suggests that they might be eternal, but I don't see how the ball and pillow could be eternal given his uh, arguments uh, to the effect that there, there can't be an, an actual infinite. I would like to know why God did, did these three things. If, if he really has some reason for permitting all the non-belief in the world, why did he send out missionaries in the Great Commission? Why did he tell us that um, loving him is the uh, greatest uh, commandment uh, that there is? Uh, why did he... Uh, empower the missionaries with, with uh, miraculous healing powers. I mean, uh, 
if, if he really wanted, um, uh, it, it seems at that time he, he wanted the whole world to become uh, believers. Why did he stop? Why didn't he continue with that? Um, we need an explanation. Why did he permit the rise of uh, uh, Islam? I, I would suggest the best explanation is that that God, God defined as a being who wants everybody to believe and has that as his top priority, um, it doesn't exist. Now, as for morality, I agree that there are clear cases of uh, morally wrong actions. But what that means is that uh, we have uh, apprehended certain moral truths. And how do we apprehend these moral truths? Well, we have, we have genes. We, um, we have social conditioning that incline us towards certain moral judgments. Uh, it seems to me that that's all we need by way of explanation for the fact that uh, practically everybody would say certain things are morally wrong and other things are not morally wrong in certain cases. Then there's a whole lot of disagreement as well. But it seems to me that we don't have to appeal to God to explain why people agree in their moral judgments. Now, as for the uh, resurrection, I didn't uh, get to say much about that. Um, I don't agree that it's a historical fact. Uh, there are many things about scripture that I find um, questionable. Um, uh, there are contradictions in the uh, resurrection accounts. Um, and uh, if anybody would like examples of those, I could cite them during the question and answer period. And also, if you have any other question uh, that I didn't get a chance to address during my talk, I would answer it then. Um, it must be remembered that the Gospels were written at least 30 years after the crucifixion. In that time, rumors developed, and they could have been embellished. The people who wrote the Gospels were uh, proselytizers. They wanted to win converts to a new religion. They weren't historians. They weren't perfectly objective and neutral. Um, there would be a number of reasons why uh, we shouldn't regard the resurrection as a historical fact. And it, it isn't regarded that way. If you look at any history book, uh, you will find that uh, it will say, well, these people believe in the resurrection, but uh, certainly it's not stated as th this is a historical fact. Well, as I said, if anybody has uh, questions about other matters that I didn't get to, I would be uh, glad to address them during the question and answer period. Thank you very much.